Amen. So let's continue to pray for those being affected um, by these storms. I was delighted. I've, there's several things that I've been delighted to see in regards to this. One of them was um, our president and, and other leaders around a conference table in prayer. There, oftentimes uh, when there's tragedy, people realize their need for God. And there's something about that when we recognize um, that when, when tragedy strikes, that we run to God, that we trust in Him. It's been said that there's no atheists in foxholes, right? Uh, and so like when times get tough and tragedy strikes, uh, all of a sudden people who don't really think about God very much, all of a sudden start thinking about God and start realizing they need God to intervene, to rescue and those of us who are here, most of us who are here, we're those who recognize daily our need for God. And so it's no new thing for us to call out on God and ask for his help because we do that daily. We look to him daily. And I just encourage you to live in that place where you are leaning upon his grace, where you're depending upon him daily, where you're recognizing your need for him to be your refuge, to be your strength, to be your ever, ever present help, not just in trouble, but every day. That you and I as Christians, we abide in him, we walk with him, we stay connected with him. Amen. This morning, we're going to continue our series uh, in the book of Mark. We have uh, this sermon and one more in the book of Mark. Um, we have looked at the theme of the kingdom of God throughout uh, the, fir- the first half of the book of Mark. Jesus, the king, came preaching the good news of the kingdom. He came to bring his kingdom here on earth. And we started off in Mark chapter 1 talking about how God's kingdom is his reign. And his reign that has come to reign and rule in the hearts of men and women. To reign within us. And Jesus declared the kingdom. He displayed the power of the kingdom. And then he commissioned his church to go and advance the kingdom, to carry on the kingdom work until he returns and we see the fullness, the consummation of the kingdom come. We talked about how we as the church, we live in a time, what theologians call the already not yet. We live in a time where Jesus, the king, has come. He brought the kingdom. The kingdom is here. Those of us who are Christians are part of the kingdom. We're kingdom citizens But yet, the kingdom is still to come. And we look for that. We long for that. And we pray for that. Jesus taught his people to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught his people to prioritize the kingdom. To seek first the kingdom of God and and his righteousness. And so this is major for us. This is priority for us. This is core for us as Christians to be kingdom focused, kingdom minded, that we prioritize the kingdom of God. We also looked at, looked at um, the second week of, of responses to the message of the kingdom in Mark chapter four, that there are people who hear and they don't respond to it. The, the Satan snatches the word. There are people who uh, the cares of this life, the thorns choke the word and the message becomes unfruitful. There's those who don't have any depth. And then there's good soil where those who hear the word, the message of the kingdom, they hear it, they accept it and they hold fast to it and they bear fruit, lots of fruit. And I would like to think that that's most of us in here today, all of us in here today, that we're that good soil. We're those who hear the word. We accept it and we bear fruit. We want to be that, right? We want to be fruit bearers so that the king gets glory and honor for the fruit that comes forth from our lives. And this week we are going to look at Jesus as the suffering servant. You see, the kingdom of God has many paradoxes. Uh, Jesus taught many things that were a paradigm shift for the people of his day. And they're, they're a par- to, to accept them would be a paradigm shift for, for us in our day. And one of those paradigms is that Christ is the king, came to suffer, and he came to serve. And that's what we're going to look at today in Mark chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, uh, go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 10, verse 32. In this passage, uh, Jesus predicts his death the, the third time in the Gospel of Mark. Mark 10, verse 32. 
And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will deliver him to death, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. That sounds uh, very straightforward. Whatever, whatever we ask of you, teacher, do it for us, right? These guys had some audacity here to, to say that. Do what we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit one on your right hand and one on your left in glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink you will drink in the baptism with which I am baptized. You will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they became (laughs) indignant at James and John. The other disciples got upset at them for asking Jesus this question, the timing of this. Um, and And Jesus called them to him and he said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them, but it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many." And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So here's where we're going this morning in this text, in this sermon. Jesus is our King who came to serve and suffer for us, to be an example and exchange His life for ours. Jesus is our King who came to serve and suffer, to be an example for us and exchange exchange His life for us. For ours. So Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem and he knew that he would die there. He knew that he would be crucified uh, just outside of Jerusalem, that they would they would flog him, that they would condemn him to death. As we saw last week in in Mark chapter eight, when Jesus said that he was going to suffer and die, Peter kind of got in got in the way and tried to tried to block what was going on there. And Jesus rebuked Peter. He said, get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. And so Jesus lived with this sense of purpose that he came to suffer. He came to die for us. In this text, we also see a paradox and there's several kingdom paradoxes. I've mentioned a couple of them. Uh, Last week, we looked at one where Jesus says, he who tries to save his life will lose it. If you try to preserve your life and save your life, you'll lose it. So life comes through death. Just some kingdom paradoxes here. I just listed out some of them. There's probably several others here that we could find biblically. We gain life through losing our life. Okay, this is a paradox. Greatness comes through serving. We see that in this text here. If you want to be great, then be the servant of all. Uh, Exaltation comes through humility. God exalts the humble, but he but he he humbles those who exalt themselves. Strength comes through weakness. Scripture says that God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. It's okay to be weak. God knows that we're weak. And when we recognize our weakness and we come to God with our weakness, he fits his strength in there, his grace in there perfectly to enable us to be who he's called us to be and do what he's called us to do. Uh, glory comes through suffering. Glory comes through suffering. 
Jesus, when he was on the cross, uh, in John's gospel, he refers to him going to the cross as being glorified. He's lifted up. There's glory in that suffering. Of course, he didn't just go to the cross. He went to the grave and he was resurrected from the grave. But glory comes through suffering. The first shall be last. The poor are rich. It's more blessed to give than to receive. These are all kingdom paradoxes. These are all areas for us as Christians to change the way we think from the world's way of thinking and operating and adjust our lives to these kingdom values, this kingdom way of living. This is what Jesus did. Jesus came to give his life and And it's a paradox that the king would come and die. That's not normal. Kings fight and they kill for their kingdom. They don't come and die. They come and they kill and they do whatever they can to keep their kingdom. And they take it by force. But Jesus' kingdom was different. It had a different way of operating. He would come and lay his life down. Nobody took it from him. But he he laid his life down on the cross to bring his kingdom, to bring his reign. Uh, John Piper says this about this, that God decided that the kingdom of God would be the most would be most gloriously revealed in a crucified and risen king. God decided the kingdom of God would be most gloriously revealed in a crucified and risen king. There's glory in the reality that Jesus suffered and died. My first point this morning is that Jesus, our King, came to suffer. He knew that. Uh, this was, again, the third time that he predicted his death. Mark chapter 8, verse 31, and then Mark 9, 31, and then here in Mark 10, uh, 32 through 34, he said that they would condemn him to death, deliver him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, spit on him, flog him, and kill him. And after three days, he would rise. This is interesting. This is interesting that the king would suffer. That he would leave, come down from heaven to earth, and step into our broken world. A world that has hurricanes. A world that has sickness. A world that has injustice. A world that has war and calamity. A world that was messy. Jesus stepped into that for us. He he identified with our sufferings. And and the scripture says that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. He's a high priest who came and he was tempted and he suffered and he stepped into the brokenness of this world. And yet he never sinned once. He handled the suffering and the temptation and the struggles of this world sinlessly, without sinning. And he, he can sympathize, aid those who are being tempted because he's been tempted. He suffered for us. He, and through his suffering, Isaiah 53 says this, and this is uh, referring to the Messiah who would come and suffer, the suffering servant. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. We sang about this this morning. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised. He was esteemed not. We esteemed him not. Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that was led to the slaughter, like a sheep that was before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. This is our suffering king. The one who came to rescue us. And he suffered so that he might alleviate eternal suffering for you and I who are part of his kingdom. You see, when we get to heaven in the age to come, in the resurrection, there will be no more suffering. 
You can say hallelujah to that. There will be no more cancer in the resurrection in the age to come. There will be no more injustice. There will be no more war. There will be no more pain or sorrow. Uh, Revelation 21 says he will wipe every tear from our eyes. You see, this is our hope. This is our hope, not only that the kingdom of God has come, but the kingdom of God will come in its fullness. The king will return and he will judge the living and the dead and he will establish forever his kingdom where there is perfect peace and harmony and love. Just think about a world of perfect love. I mean, we've never experienced that. We've gotten taste of it being Christians, being a part of the church. But of course, the church isn't perfect. We have some flaws, don't we? But heaven's going to be perfect. Jesus suffered to alleviate our suffering for eternity. Doesn't mean we won't suffer in this life still. Actually, he says we will. If we're going to follow him, following Jesus means that we enter into his suffering. That we too follow his his steps of, of suffering for his sake, for the gospel's sake. So this is Jesus. This is what he came to do. He suffered for us. And we experience healing through his suffering, by his stripes. We sing about, every Sunday we sing about this truth. We, we celebrate this truth. We take communion every Sunday and we center our lives on the gospel and on the reality that Christ suffered for us. Because we think about it much and talk about it much means that we need to... to to ponder it a little bit deeper and not just go through the motions when we take of, partake of communion or when we sing songs about the cross. We need to pause, Selah, really think about this reality that Christ has suffered for us, that he, he suffered in our place, that he took our place. The next thing that we see here is that Jesus, our king, came to serve. This is a paradox. What king gets down and washes feet Kings get pampered, right? They get served. You know, I mean, just think about a a world leader, you know, you know, arriving and and all of a sudden he starts serving, holding the door and helping, helping others, you know, instead of uh, instead of being served. Jesus came to be this kind of king when Jesus was washing his disciples feet in John chapter 13. So he he modeled this uh, servanthood to his disciples Peter had a hard time letting Jesus do that. He was like, whoa, 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 not, you can't wash my feet. There was a paradigm shift that had to take place in the disciples. If Jesus the king served, then that means you and I must follow in his footsteps. Jesus gives this, this little sermon, this, these words about serving in response to James and John, the, the sons of Zebedee, And their request, Jesus just says he's going to die. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to be mocked and beaten and, and, and killed. Just think about the timing of this. He just tells his disciple that, again, for the third time, I'm going to die for you guys. I'm going to go. I'm going to die. And then these guys have the audacity to plug in, to put in their request to sit at the right hand and the left of Jesus. I mean, just think about the timing of that. I mean, just, I mean, think if you're... Your dad comes home and, 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 and from, from the doctor and says, you know, I, 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 um, they, the doctor gave me six months to live. I'm, I got cancer. I'm going to die. And the first thing you say is like, well, dad, can I, um, can I be uh, head of your business or can I get this or that? I mean, the timing of that, like, come on, like, like, let that sink in. What, what's happening here? Dad's like grieve, like, you know, uh, and these guys, these guys are asking for a position. You know, Jesus taught, hey, asking you shall receive. And they're, they're doing it. You know, they're asking, hey, make sure and set us up. We want one at the right, one at the left. And Jesus was gracious to them. He didn't give them a stern rebuke. But he used it as an opportunity to teach them about the mindset that they need to have if they're going to be followers of Jesus. He says, don't be like the Gentiles who lord over it, who use their authority to make others their servants. To make others serve them. The Son of Man did not come to be served. And you would think that that's fitting since he's a king, right? He's a king. King should be served. That's our thinking, right? But he came to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
For those of you who are parents, you have lots of opportunities to apply this message to your, to your children. You have lots of opportunities, if you have newborn babes, uh, to change diapers, to feed babies, to, to attend them when they're, when they're crying, when they're whining, when, they're, when there's a problem, when they're hurting. And you don't get a lot of return, right? It's, I mean, you, you, your heart's delighted. You, that's a return, I guess. You get plenty of delight and pleasure in them as your, as your children. But, you know, especially when they're young, I mean, the things for you, right, early on. Uh, and so as parents, we get opportunity to display the love of Christ to our children. Those of you who are married, you get plenty of opportunities to serve your spouse. To love your spouse and serve your spouse, to, to die to your preferences and your comforts so that for the good of your spouse, your husband or your wife. This is what a Christ-centered marriage looks like. This is what a Christ-centered family looks like, one that is marked by service. Men, we don't, we don't get home from work expecting our wives and kids to serve us, that, that we come home ready to serve. That we come home, and, and that may look like being ready to listen, right? <laughs> yeah. It may be, so for some of us, it may be easier to do the dishes than it is to just sit there and listen and let, <laughs> let your spouse pour out their heart to you, right? But that's a way that we can serve. We can practically serve. And this displays Christ. This is what Christ came to do. If we're going to follow Jesus, it means that we give our lives to a life of service. And that's what the Bradleys are doing. You know, they're, they're going to Ethiopia to follow Jesus, to display the love of Christ there, to serve the people of Ethiopia. And it's worth it. It's worth it. It will be worth it when they see Jesus. It's worth it. And it's worth it for you and I in our day-to-day grind to serve and live like Jesus. Oftentimes it means... You know, getting out of our comfort zone. And and again, following Jesus means that you deny yourself, take up your cross, that you be with him wherever he's at, that you think like him, you speak like him, and you live like him. That's what it means to follow Jesus. So Jesus came to serve, and so must we. You know, I've been delighted by all the volunteers and all um, with Hurricane Harvey. Just all the, uh, if you've seen some of the pictures, that are out there. Um, there's there's one of this this guy carrying this mom with a with a baby out of the floodwaters, and there's just there's so many there's so many displays of the love of Christ happening right now, where people are being like the Good Samaritan, and they're going they're leaving their their their, their regular schedules, and they're going down to the devastation, to the broken homes, to the the, the families that are in in need, and they're 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 serving them. The love of Christ is being displayed through that. And when there's devastation like this, it's an opportunity for us, church, to show the love of Christ. We should uh, look at the needs and seek to serve. And by the way, this is, those of you who are here have this mindset. Those of you who are part of this church plant, I think you, you're part of this because you have that mindset. Because there are more opportunities here at City Church Garland to serve than there are to be served. <laughs> Y'all laugh at that because you know it's true, right? <laughs> and so I commend you for that. I commend you for having that mindset, that, that kingdom mindset that you're going to serve. You're going you're gonna to be a, you're going to make a difference. You don't go to church just to be served. Kick your feet up. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to just hit on this. I, I hit on this last week. Our culture does that. There are popcorn Christians, if you will, that all around the, the Dallas Metroplex, they, They'll, they'll, they'll go to a church for a season and they're looking for what can, what's in it for me here. They got this ministry, this, this and that. And, they're, and, they, and, then, and then when they're done with that church, they go to another church. They pop into another church. And there's this mindset of what can this church do for me? And the mindset that Christ calls his followers to take on is what can we do for others? How can we serve others? How can we love others? And you know what? You will find that you have the greatest joy and satisfaction when you live like that. You'll find, you'll find yourself empty and dis, disillusioned and disappointed when you have the mindset of, how can this person serve me? 
How can this church serve me? How can this job place serve me? How can, uh, how can I be served here? What's in it for me? And when you change, when you have a paradigm, paradigm shift and you embrace the paradox of the kingdom, how can I serve? You will find greater joy in that. That's the way of Christ. Amen? Missionaries have to do that. And Christians who truly follow Jesus have to do that. So Jesus came to serve. Let us as well do the same. Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 8, uh, expounds on this paradigm shift that we need to have. It says, Have this mind among yourselves, which, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the gospel. Jesus had the mindset of a servant. And and Paul in Philippians 2 here is calling the saints in Philippi to have that same mindset. Jesus, though he was God, he didn't cling to his rights as God. He emptied himself. He laid down his rights. He laid down his life. He took the form of a servant. He stepped into the messiness and the brokenness of our world so that he can deliver us out of eternal suffering in hell. So that we might have eternal life. So that we might be redeemed and rescued. And he did this. To the point of death, even death of the cross. This is the ultimate act of service. This is the ultimate act of service. May we never lose the wonder of this. May we never lose awe and wonder of what Christ has done and how far he humbled himself. How low he went for us. Not just to earth, but he went to the grave for us. Amen. So lastly, Jesus, our king, came to be our sacrifice. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came to exchange his life for ours. Imagine if you were on death row, you broke the law, and you were about to get death row. In Texas, we we have that here, right? And, and you were about to be executed. And somebody you don't know stepped in and says, no, stop, wait, wait. I want to die for him or her. I mean, I don't know if they would let that happen here in Texas. But, but in God's court of law, this has happened. Jesus stepped in. You and I deserve the death penalty because of our sin. We deserve eternal separation from God in hell because of our sin. And Jesus stepped in because of his love for us, moved by love and obedience to the Father, love for God, love for us. He gave his life for us in exchange for ours so that we might live. He took our place. He paid our debt. So that we can be forgiven and be free. When you get this, it changes everything. I mean, those of you who've had any debt, have felt the pressures of financial debt. You've had credit cards or mortgages, car payments, and, and, and it's, you've just felt the weight of that debt pressing in on you to where like you can't even function. Like it just, it breaks you down or it, it doesn't feel good when you have a debt. And our debt was greater than what we could ever pay. And Jesus stepped in and he paid that. He became the ransom, the payment for our sins. And it wasn't a payment to Satan. It was a payment to Almighty God to satisfy the justice of God for you and I. You see, all throughout the Old Testament, there were these sacrifices offered up to God. There were animal sacrifices. God instructed Moses through the law to uh, instructed the, the Israelites to offer up these sacrifices. There were annual sacrifices. There were all kinds of sacrifices. It was very messy. Sacrifices were very messy. Like, you know, we read about it, we glance over it, and we, we may not grasp how messy it, it was for the Old Testament uh, saints to, to offer up these sacrifices. There was blood. 
I'm sure that a lot of those animals were squealing and yelling. And I'm sure some of those animals probably felt like, like dear pets to some of the family members, right? They're like, oh, my doggy. They, I don't think they offered up dogs, but the lambs, you know, the lambs, the little lamb. I mean, cute little lambs. I could just picture my kids just loving the little lambs uh, if we had lambs or chickens, right? And then seeing that animal being put on an altar and killed, bleeding, squealing. We got some animal lovers back here just like, no, no. So Christ died for us to be a ransom for our sins in our place. Uh, theologians call this a substitutionary atonement. He took our place. He satisfied the wrath of God for us. The justice of God for us. The death penalty was paid for us in our place. And what Mark says in, in Mark chapter 15, when Jesus died, listen, it's Mark 15, 37 through 39. And Jesus uttered a loud cry, and he breathed his last, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two, from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Something divine was happening here. The, 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 the veil or the curtain in the temple was torn in two. This curtain separated uh, the, the Holy of Holies. And so once a year, the, the priests would go in there and they would offer up a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement on behalf of the people. And so there was this separation. Not just anybody could go into that holy place, right? Had to be a high priest once a year. And so one of the statements that, that's being made through that from God is that through Jesus' perfect sacrifice, you and I now have access to God. We have acceptance from God. We're forgiven because Christ has died in our place. But then the, the, the veil in the, in the temple was, was torn. The veil that separated the holiest place. I'm, I'm just going to do this here. We got a veil here. And Sonia, you're, you're going to be on the other side here. Okay. Okay, picture this is the veil, all right? All right. This separates us from Sonia here, okay? All right. And when Jesus died and he breathed his last breath, that was ripped and torn open. So now Sonia, you can come join us. Come on, come on over here. <laughs> You can be a part of the family of God. You can be a part of the people of God. You now have a place at the table of God for all eternity where there's no more sickness, there's no more death, there's no more disease, there's no more sorrow. You will have a new body. You will be raised to life forevermore. And this is our hope. All because Christ came to serve. He came to suffer for you and I. And he came to be our sacrifice, our perfect sacrifice. This should make us worship. This should lead us to be extravagant worshipers, those who sing with all of our hearts, who lift our hands, clap our hands, who cry, who pour out our hearts, and then pour out our lives in service to the King of Kings and pour out our lives in service to others. And so... Here's the application. Because Jesus came to suffer, because he came to serve, because he came to be our sacrifice, expect to experience sufferings as you follow Jesus. They will come. Persecution, suffering will come. If you're going to follow Jesus as as your example, expect that suffering will come to you as a follower of Jesus. And then seek to serve those around you. Don't have the mindset of what's in this for me. Have the mindset of how can I serve those around me? Uh, let me ask you this question. When you are the most powerful person in the room, the, the, the person of authority, what do you do? How do you act towards those under your authority when you're the most powerful person in the room? Do you expect those people to serve you? 
I mean, if you're parents, then you get those opportunities a lot with your kids. Uh, my wife went to the women's retreat for two days recently, and I had three precious little lives with me, and I had opportunities to apply this sermon to my own family. <laughs> what am I going to do when I got Carson, Karis, and Abigail, and they want to go play golf, and they want to hang out with Daddy? We had fun, didn't we? We went to the park, and we did some things. And so what are we going to do when, when you are in, in your workplace? You're the supervisor. You're the boss. All right? How are you going to treat those who are under your care when they mess up? Are you going to show grace to them? Are you going to just point out their, their flaws? Or are you going to get down and serve and help them be the best that they can be? That's the mindset of Christ. Uh, and then be willing to sacrifice your comfort, your security, and life for others. This is a lot easier said than done. And I'm, I'm so glad that the Bradleys are here today as I'm preaching this because they're like, they're a great example of this for us. They are leaving tomorrow on a plane to go to Ethiopia to do this very thing we're talking about here. To go serve, to love. And they're sacrificing comfort, security, and their lives. In a sense, for the gospel's sake, for the kingdom of God, for the people of Ethiopia. And First John says this, First John 3, 16 and 17. We all know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Amen to that. I, we, that should sink in first, okay? And when that sinks in, when that really sinks in, when we really get John 3.16, then John, 1 John 3.16 should be the domino effect. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And so this is our application, brothers and sisters. Lay down your life for the brothers, the sisters, those around you, just like Jesus did. And you will find true life in doing so. You will find joy in doing so. And it's worth it. It's worth it in the end. Man, if you would pray with me. Father, this is so core to the gospel, to Christianity, and to who we are as your people. And I pray that these wouldn't just be familiar words that we just nod yes to and say amen to, but these would be truths and realities that we embrace in our hearts and apply to our lives for your glory, for the good of others, and for our joy. May we apply this kingdom truth to our life. Of this kingdom reality of, of serving, of giving our lives away, losing our lives, and finding true life as we do. Move us in the action. Move us onto your agenda. As the worship team leads us in this next song, um, I'd like to pray for anybody here. If you're here today and, and you haven't received Jesus as your sacrifice for your sins, and you need that to sink in, and you need that to become a truth that you, uh, that you accept and believe and experience the benefits of, because the scripture says that if you will believe in Jesus, if you will receive Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, your sins will be forgiven. You will have eternal life. He wants to wash your feet. He wants to save your soul. And the, the natural effects, the effects of you letting Him do that, and coming to Him as Savior and as Lord of your life, the effects will be your, that you lay down your life for others. So if you want to receive what Christ has done for you and get in line and with, with that message, with that kingdom reality and live your life for His glory and His kingdom, I'd like to pray for you. 
So if you would, just raise your hand. If you want prayer, you can come up as the worship team leads us. I cast my mind on Calvary where Jesus bled.